hey everybody, I've been killed! Don't worry, in the words of Australian game Blood on the Clock Tower, death is not the end. That's a catchy line, someone should write a song with that title. About six years ago, I went to a magical place, a board game convention, and then a stranger told me that they played this prototype, and it might be very good, it might be the best game they've ever played. It's a new version of Werewolf. And then I said to them, Please, a social deduction game? We need one of those as much as we need another joke from Ricky Gervais. I didn't say that, I wasn't actually quite that rude. Anywho, that game was Blood on the Clock Tower, and six years later, it's right here on this pedestal. And in my opinion, it is one of the best social deduction games ever made. As I mentioned, Blood on the Clock Tower is a social deduction game based on Werewolf, which itself is based on another game called Mafia. If you don't know those, you might have encountered a derivative such as The Resistance or the Lockdown Digital Hit Among Us. In Werewolf slash Mafia, and also in BOTC, each participant sits in a circle whilst an adjudicator hands everyone out a secret role that only they will. No. In Werewolf, for example, these roles might be of villagers who are quote-unquote the good players and have various different abilities, or werewolves who try to remain hidden because they are the bad guys. Even if you've never played one of these games before, I think by now you get it. Everyone but the moderator gets a secret role, some of which don't want to reveal themselves, and then the evening descends into a heady miasma of misdirection and lies until you suss out the bad people or they kill everyone and win. And if you have played one of these games, you probably have some strong feelings about the genre. Feelings that can be grouped into three categories. Loving it, tired of it, or I'd rather drink vinegar than play these. So then, the point of this video, which I think will be intensely entertaining and informative no matter which of these categories you fall into, and that is not an empty promise. When I got this behemoth, despite already having played the game many times at conventions and getting to muck around with a prototype years before, thank you Quinton Smith, I had to ask myself one honest question. Why would anyone spend money on this? After all, you can just play Mafia or Werewolf. The rules are available online for free and you can write down the rules on some cards. Or you can just buy this. It's not even like 20 quid. Well, I do have an answer, but to get there, I first had to ask, why do people enjoy these games? Or why do people hate these games? And to get to that, I had to dig to the very beginning. And boy, do I have a few stories to share. Ultimate Werewolf has evolved from a traditional Russian folk game in ages past to the party game played around the world today. The 1980s saw the rise of Mafia as a theme for similar day-night hidden role games replaced several years later with werewolves. What a crock of ships. This quote comes from the back of the Ultimate Werewolf rulebook, designed by Ted Allspark and published by his company, Bezier Games. And whilst there is a twinge of truth here, for example, the game did originate in Russia and it does have a strong folk tradition, I find it curious how much this text wriggles to not credit the game's original creator. Not only can Mafia be traced to one person, but its origination has a near exact date and a pretty precise location. In November of 1987, a then psychology student Dmitry Davidov at Moscow State University was writing a paper on how people spend time and simultaneously teaching high schoolers aka test subjects. At first, he was experimenting with unstructured time, meaning he put people in a room with zero instructions and watched what they would do, which is obviously nothing. He then tested out the idea of handing out a secret topic to a select few and see if the group could guess what that topic was. I think you can guess what happens next. He invented Mafia, but it's the how that's interesting. Here Davidov introduces the idea of right playing, as in introducing rituals to unstructured time, hence the birth of the day-night cycle. He further cites Lev Vygotsky as an influence on whom we'll touch upon later, and also the Turing test, which is the one where you see if who you're talking to is a robot. Before we delve into what 
any of this means, I would like to talk about Davidov himself first, because he is, well, actually, I have no idea who he is. My first encounter with Davidov was through an interview for an article about Werewolf by Margaret Robertson published in 2010 in Wired UK. There's a link in the description and it's a really great article, I suggest you give it a read. Davidov comes across as elusive, distant, toying with the interviewer rather than providing any answers with substance. And he also, <laughs> he also refuses to be interviewed unless they conducted in the world of Warcraft. So that's definitely, as we say in the Mafia, a baller move. The article itself speculates that this is pretty much par for the course for someone who invented the game that he then himself labelled as the uninformed majority versus the informed minority. That definition is important, we'll come back to it later. To divulge information would be to divulge power. There are other interviews with Davidov, all scarce on details, sometimes conflicting, but here's the gist of things he has provided about himself. One, he is a living human being. Two, he is from Russia, but sometime in the 90s he moved to Boston. Three, he studied psychology and continues to work in the field. Four, he has a dog, or at least had one in 2010. And five, he invented Mafia. There is also a picture of him, but it's the same picture in all of the interviews, and if you click on one of them in the description you will be able to find that picture because he produced it himself and I probably don't have the right to show that. Also, that picture is from 1987. I think. Funnily, there's a PowerPoint presentation circulating online that uses a different image of Davidov, but after a reverse image search, I traced it to a stock photo called Man Smoking a Cigarette, aka how everyone in the world imagines a Russian professor. Which is, of course, where I had to ask myself, is this person even real? I mean, think about it, there's one dubious photo which he keeps sharing as late as 2019 with the insistence that, oh, we didn't have cell phones back then. Well, you have one now, right? There's the evasiveness, there's nothing concrete that we know about the person who invented one of the most played games in the world. That just doesn't add up. There were just a few more breadcrumbs which I could use, so... I started an investigation, and as amazing as it would have been for me to return to you and say, I've uncovered the plot of the century! And for a while there I thought that maybe I did, with the help of a few folk who I'll refrain from crediting because it's getting into a very murky territory here, I've been able to confirm that Dmitry Davidov is definitely the real deal. I won't be divulging any details here and ask that you trust me. Whatever his reasons might be, clearly Davidov is just a very private person and I think that it's best left alone. So we don't know much about Davidov, but we know a lot about his intentions behind designing the game and actually that's kind of what's important to this video as much as I've enjoyed being handed the role of Detective. The design of Mafia was quite different from the werewolf that we know today. There were no special roles and therefore no moderator because there was no need for one. Each player was handed a card at the beginning that denoted them either as honest or Mafia. Mafia players learned who each other were and then the game proceeded until only one team had members left standing. During the day, all players, good and bad, enter discussions to try and figure out who the Mafia are. And they also have the chance to try and kill someone through a vote. They can also vote to advance to the night time where they're able to confirm the identity of the person that they've just killed. But that also gives a chance to the Mafia members to try and eliminate someone of their choice. I'm not going to dissect this design anymore. A lot of you have probably either played Mafia or one of its many derivatives, so you can imagine exactly how it feels. But I do want to pull at its two sources and how they influence the design. I say two, I actually mean three, but I think the Turing test and its influence is pretty self-evident here. So first, let's talk about Lev Vygotsky. Vygotsky, he was a big emphasis of the zone of proximal development, the ZPD, which means you look at what someone can do totally on their own, 
and what someone can do with all the help in the world. And you're gonna see there's a great difference. For instance, when it comes to plumbing, I know absolutely nothing. But if I shadowed a plumber for a while, mm. eventually I'd start learning how to do plumbing. And eventually the plumber may say, do you wanna take over and watch me do some of the things? And this is known as scaffolding, where at first you show them how to do it and then you do most of the work, but let them do a couple of the things. And eventually they're driving the car all on their own. And that's a very generic example of the zone of proximal development and scaffolding, but that is what Vygotsky is most famous for, is that right there. But he also talked about the importance of culture, and he has three main rules. And this is a long-winded way to get to answer your question. The one is, culture is crucial when understanding cognitive development, which was a huge departure from the idea of Piaget, because Piaget, uh, said, oh, this happens no matter where you're from or who you are. But Vygotsky said, no, 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 no. It depends on your very specific culture. And by culture, we don't just mean national culture. We may even mean your birth order or the very small family culture that you're in. It can get very specific. So that's rule one of three. Rule two is language really feeds into culture and culture feeds into language and they're inseparable. And this is a fascinating rabbit hole we could go down into. How much are we, we, because of the language we learn? The third rule is that your cognitive development greatly changes based upon the specific cultural role you are in. So when you look around the culture, if you see that there's an opening for some type of role that needs to be played, you will fulfill that role mostly because all the other people around you are indicating that that role needs to be fulfilled. So how does this inform the game of mafia or werewolf? So in this way that roles inform who we are and how we cognitively develop, this is the pressure cooker example of the Zimbardo prison study, which is a horrible study. It has a lot of flaws and it's problematic. That's another conversation. But the point remains, it's amazing how much we change based upon the roles we are given or put into. They're totally informed. And there is a theorist, George Kelly, who is the basically the father of fixed role therapy. This idea that we only like to do things that we're comfortable doing. And so if we were to act like someone completely different, that's jumping into the deep end of the pool and learning what it's like to be someone different. And inevitably, in that time of role playing as somebody else, you're going to pick and choose almost like you're in an aisle of a grocery store, the things that you like and ignore the things you don't. So when you come back to behaving like yourself, you are potentially forever different because you tried on this new personality, this new role. So when you combine the ideas of Vygotsky and Mafia with the social roles very specifically by Zimbardo and this idea of fixed role therapy from George Kelly, you start really appreciating the impact that these social deduction games can have because here are the stakes. If you are acting like you are the demon or the werewolf or the mafia or whatever it may be, and you learn these different techniques of lying or convincing people that you are telling the truth, you could potentially be learning something that forever changes your personality. I think I'm gonna take this off. No reason, just don't want it anymore. I hope it's becoming evident that Mafia is less of a game and more of a psychology experiment, or maybe somewhere in between. But if Davidov was observing how people molded themselves into new roles, another question springs to mind. Why mafia? When I was three years old, I attended the only Soviet parade that I can remember. I was handed a little red Soviet flag and was told to wave it about by my parents. I'm pretty sure it was Lenin's birthday or something. Seeing the flags waved about, I wondered how great this Lenin dude must have been if so many of us are gathered together. So I asked my parents about it, and then I was told to shut up and wave the flag. I can't recall many more events like that, because that's around the time that Perestroika was starting to really kick in, a great economic upheaval which presented a multitude of opportunities for those who were willing to exploit them. It was a time of uncertainty 
and instability, the perfect environment for organized crime to breed. If you lived in one of the Soviet states, it was everywhere. Anyone who wanted to make something of themselves, a little bit more than the standard 200 ruble salary, had at least a tenuous connection to smuggling, the black market, bribery, or whatever else. You were either honest or you were mafia. And if you are an honest person and you're playing this game, exactly what skills are you learning? Oh. Oh, relax, don't be scared. I'm not really a werewolf. It's just me, the Mafia. Thanks to a number of exchange students who were taking part in these early sessions of Mafia, the game started to proliferate and it did so at alarming speed. By the mid nineties, the game was played across the former Soviet states, America, China, everywhere. And because it wasn't tied to a commercial product, but rather spread by word of mouth, as all folk games, it started to Katamari house rules. Back in 1997, um, I went to a convention and someone was playing a game called Mafia that they had learned at some other convention. And uh, we, we played a few rounds of that. I was terrible at it. And I went home and said, you know, I bet my friends would like to learn about this. So I put up a web page. This was 1997, so there was a web, but it was 1997, so not everybody. So like you could put up a web page about the subject, and it was the first one. And I thought, well, as I was writing, I thought, you know, Mafia doesn't actually make sense as a uh, as a topic for this game because you you know who the Mafia are. Since the original game came out of Russia, I think Mafia had a different connotation than it did to Americans. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't realize where the game had come from. So I was thinking, well, you know, mafia aren't like mafia don't sneak around at night. Um, who sneaks around at night? Werewolves sneak around at night. Like the whole point of a werewolf, um, mythically, is that you don't know who it is until it's nighttime. So I just swapped out the theme. Uh, I didn't actually change the rules in any other way. I, I wrote them down as I learned them, except for a, like a little bit of detail about how you select the uh, the moderator. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit open, but the game was the same game. I just wrote it down and said, well, you know, I learned this as mafia, but it's more fun as werewolves. Like people w will recognize the ideas better if you write it that way. And so here it is. And then I taught it to a few of my friends and they taught it to a few of their friends. And a couple of years later, I went to uh, Origins, the game convention, and there's like entire hallways of people playing werewolf, um, sit like sitting in circles. And I'm like, what? What, what happened? <laughs> what happened indeed? In one of his interviews, Davidov mentions that in the early 90s, he was in talks with Hasbro to make a commercial version of Mafia, but the deal fell through because Hasbro deemed it unprotectable. I think they underestimate how much power they have when they install a standardized product into people's consciousness. Monopoly, a design they stole themselves, is plagiarized all over the world, but if you were gonna get yourself a copy, are you gonna get some knockoff? Or are you gonna get Monopoly? I think I'm grateful that they turned it down because the werewolf we have today is fundamentally a different game from Mafia because of the open source folk nature of how it spread. If there was a commercial product to cement it, I wonder if we would have seen Ultimate Werewolf, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, Quantum Werewolf, Werewolf Legacy, Werewords, The Resistance, Werewolves of Miller's Hollow, or its French title, Les Loups-Garous de Tiersalou. Don't mess with Cthulhu, fake artist goes to New York, Secrets, but it's best we forget about Secrets, the game that was rethemed by fans to Harry Potter, which is now ironically also problematic, Will Wheaton, Mafia the Movie, which is the worst film I've seen this year, and I see seen Moonfall, the werewolf game, the movie, the second worst film I've seen this year, and I repeat, I have seen Moonfall, the genius, Lemon Jelly, Among Us, the list goes on, we didn't start the lying, it was always burning since November 1987. That list is by far not exhaustive, and I didn't even mention the unlicensed commercial rogue prints of Werewolf and Mafia, like this one on Amazon, which does have very nice art, but also claims to be the original werewolf. Dear viewers, I have some doubts. Davidov seems a little reticent about the fact that his game ran away from him. Here's a direct quote from an interview on the website Escalageux. These games do not have a license. Companies who produce them 
intentionally mislead their customers about origins of the game. These companies took my game, invented a bogus story about its origins, and make profits while selling it. He also states that the game is not in public domain and that if anyone wishes to make a product, they should first get a license. I should note, I am not a law expert, but from what I understand, game mechanisms aren't protected by copyright, however intellectual properties are. I don't know what protections Davidov has for his game, but printing something with the name Mafia and having the exact rules is definitely a no-go zone. Plotkin has a slightly different perspective on the entire affair. I, I don't feel that I've been passed over here. It's kind of amusing. I mean, if I go to a game convention and there's people playing the game, I wander around and, you know, I'm running in the back of my head is thinking like, I could wave my arms and shout, I invented that, but <laughs> who would actually care, right? So I just walk around with a superior smirk on my face thinking, hmm. That's always the best feeling, right? Like, you know, like it's, it's this little secret that only well, no, you know. The best feeling is when you actually do get a nickel every time someone plays the game. But uh, the second best feeling... <laughs> I think I agree with him. And ironically, all these games fail to credit Davidov and consequently Plotkin because legally there's probably some shaky ground, so they present it as their own invention. Look at that! I did uncover a conspiracy. I'll reiterate, any iteration of the game mechanisms is okay by my understanding and also probably healthy for gaming as a whole. On a final note, Davidov seems uncharacteristically cranky in this interview. He comes across as more aloof and relaxed in others. Davidov's preference is for the most stripped down version of the game. Although in a forum AMA, he does mention he enjoys the creativity of the roles the community added. In a letter to Plotkin, he specifically states, I was trying not to create another role playing game. Players supposed to be themselves, but I guess Entourage is appealing. As someone who had to endure Jeremy Piven, let me unequivocally state, there is nothing appealing about Entourage, but here we finally get to see the intent behind Mafia. Remember the uninformed majority versus the informed minority? Well, as I read through Davidov's correspondence, I finally started to see a picture. The idea is that these two forces are as even-handed as possible, and the thing that tips the scales, counterintuitively, is honesty. Margaret Robertson's article on Wired paraphrases Davidov saying that the best strategy for the honest is to be honest. Then he spices up his take by stating that the best strategy for mafia is also honesty. In 2005, the Iber Holmes Middle School in Raymond, New Hampshire, received reports of a teacher playing mafia with fifth graders who seemed to have been experiencing trauma. Rockingham News quoted one parent as saying, My child has had sleepless nights, crying before bed because she's afraid that she'll sleepwalk and relive the tragic events they talked about in class. You have no idea what psychological effect this will have on kids. I'm excluding some general parental aphorisms that follow that quote, but that seems like a pretty strong reaction to a game. Right? I mean, I was fascinated by the game for a while, and I taught my friends, and I played a few games, but after a while, I thought, like, the tension of lying and not knowing who's lying to you turned out not to be what I was after in games, and so I decided, quite consciously, to be more of a chronicler than a player of the game. Mm. And then, after a while, there was too much to chronicle, and I just said, okay, but there's a web page up, we'll let other people handle it from here. Um, but there have always been people who just didn't get it or had a bad experience in their first game or everybody laughed at them and they decided, ah, this isn't fun, I'm going to go play Catan instead. So you don't keep up with it? I don't, no. I think we can all relate to that in some way. We either know someone who doesn't like social deduction games or we are that person ourselves. I talk to a lot of people who don't enjoy the experience and many have identified this one aspect that draws their distaste. They don't enjoy spending time in an environment where they either have to lie or they are being lied to. Others identified social performance pressure or the potential for being bullied. I have played so many hours of The Resistance. I actually helped sell the game at many conventions for indie board and card games. And one thing I found was that one of the most viable strategies was emotional manipulation, meaning 
cowing people, being verbally abusive to people is a superior strategy in most, especially uninitiated groups. That if I act angry or if I cow other people, insult other people, Outside of there, obviously, people would call me, and I'm not sure what language I'm allowed to use. I'm not sure if you're doing family friendly, but people would call me an astronaut uh, in the game, but definitely outside of the game if I did that. But in the game, I win. And therefore, as I walk away, I can say, I just did it for the game. And you are absolutely correct in that question of do people that perhaps have antisocial personality disorder or at least some of the symptoms of that disorder where you do not care or don't empathize with other people, maybe a lack of compassion, does that help you in these games? It absolutely can. Absolutely 110%. Because most people, when they sit down to play a game, part of that social contract is they're saying, we're here for fun. And if I transform the game into something that isn't fun, People are just going to say this isn't worth it and they'll just bend under their will. And I've had plenty of games of resistance that have ended where someone said, ha, I won. And someone has responded, did anyone really win this game? Because none of us feel better. None of us feel good about anything that just went down. A social contract? Indeed. Anytime you agree to play a social deduction game, you're also agreeing that within the context of the group, it is permissible to lie, but also to be lied to. That is not a normal environment. Sure, people do lie to you in the real world, but without your permission, and upon that, they break your trust. In a social deduction game, all of these rules go out of the window. I would like, as a point of illustration, to compare social deduction games with a certain adult niche activity with a four-letter acronym. I'm not being coy here, I'm just not saying it because I don't want the YouTube algorithm to mislabel this video. Within it, people agree to partake in an activity that is generally not desirable, receiving or inflicting physical pain and humiliation for mutual pleasure. With the latter, however, one of the many differences is that there is a strictly codified set of ethics of engagement. And with the former, your recruitment and induction consists of one measly, hey, let's play this game, it's gonna be totally radical. That's my 90s voice. To slightly de-escalate this comparison, I should probably mention that you sign a social contract when you play any game. If you agree to a game of football, you also agree that you might get hit in the face with said football and that that is okay as long as it's not intentional. Or, for example, if you agree to play a Euro game with someone who is more familiar with it than you, you also agree that you're going to be outsmarted and that that is okay and you won't be hating them for very long. But you know what you are getting yourself into. And if you've never played Mafia before, not only are you facing being thrust into what is partly a psychological experiment, but also an environment that's ripe for exploitation. And you might instinctively intuit that, but these are also large group activities and peer pressure might also be a factor. You might agree to play just because all your friends are really into it and you don't want to be a party pooper. Davidov is of a different opinion. When queried about the Ibert Holmes Middle School incident, he replied, one of the purposes of it is to teach kids to distinguish right from wrong. In order to win it, one has to become an honest citizen, take responsibility for one's own actions and be proactively good. These are some of the reasons why the game is the most popular game in the world right now. I want to reassure you that the positive message of the game would overcome any possible negative effects of an evil narrator. I don't know, Dima. Maybe someone in the game doesn't want to win. Maybe they just want to see the world burn or whatever. What damage can a person like that cause, huh? What are the kids learning then? Sorry, I went full YouTube there. It's just that I really disagree with that stance. I wish I could have talked to Davido himself about this. And we did reach out for an interview. Say the line, Bart! But as of the time of filming, we have not received a response. Yeah! Not to put words in his mouth, but I think Davidov sees his game as a holistic, balanced environment. Remember, he thinks that the best strategy on either side 
is honesty, and I think he sees mafia as a teaching tool for what he deems a very important life lesson, and damn the consequences! That's probably why he prefers his version to the numerous reinterpretations, and I think his argument here would be that it's precisely these dilutions that create the potential for danger. If only people played the game exactly as written, everything would be fine. There's still one question left to answer. We know that Mafia spread quickly all over the world, but we don't know how. Well, initially it was students and universities, just like Monopoly. No, really, that's how Monopoly first spread, through word of mouth by academics and university students. In early 2000s, Mafia saw a lot of online play, then already rebranded as Werewolf, and of course the tabletop crowd, hello, that's us right here, have done our part. But there's one secret super spreader that I haven't yet mentioned. I'm about to say a very rude word, so I apologize in advance. It's Tech Bros! That's right, Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, name a big company execs all had a hand at dabbling in werewolf in various tech conferences and boardroom meetings. Why? Surely these people wouldn't know what fun was if it hit them in the face. That is, of course, correct, because these people managed to find the absolute worst reason to play a game. Recruitment. Here when I say tech bro or tech exec, I'm sorry if I typecast you, I don't mean a specific individual, rather the general archetype. Also, I hope you can forgive me for drawing some conclusions, like that a heavily male demographic will find a game that opens up all kinds of social permissions or a gateway to bullying very appealing. But the recruitment part is not a drawn conclusion. Per the Margaret Robertson article linked before, and a few other sources, Werewolf was played at tech conferences not just for its intoxicating qualities, but also to find interesting people, or to present yourself as interesting people, because it demonstrated the sort of skill set that the high finance slash tech world requires. This kind of makes sense. I remember watching The Genius, a South Korean reality TV show that rethemed popular tabletop games, including Werewolf, as survival style competitions for a big cash prize. And every single season, the winner is the person with the most charm outside and the most slime inside. And quite a few of them are tech or finance execs. Excellent revelatory show, although I should mention that the way the contestants treat women on it is absolutely abhorrent. This tech exec appeal is further corroborated by the ultimate werewolf rulebook, which wastes no time and pitches itself to these environments. Ultimate Werewolf is a great team building exercise when played properly. It's a great way to get to know people on a team that doesn't normally have a great amount of interaction, and a fun way for a team to build relationships on a personal level. Ultimate Werewolf provides several stimulating problem-solving tasks that help group members develop their capacity to work effectively together, including decision-making, logic, and especially the ability to convey their opinions and build trust within their group. Ultimate Werewolf can be played in meetings, following presentations, as part of larger workshops, and as a refreshing break from back-to-back -back seminars, education programs, or corporate training. Ick. Just imagine working at one of these companies that likes to do activities as training exercises, and then you have to play werewolf with a bunch of suits who will use it as an opportunity to prove themselves. Uh, no thanks. I don't want to be a part of your I guess it's all been building up to this. I've laid down the cultural timeline, contextualized the mechanisms and how they reflect social dynamics, and I'm about to tell you that Blood on the Glock Tower defeats all of them. It is the answer, the panacea, the savior of social deduction games, whether you love them or hate them. Right? Uh, well, Obviously no. In fact, let me establish something straight away. If you dislike social deduction games specifically because of that social contract, you know, the one that says that lying is permissible, you're still probably gonna hate this. I just don't want to... 
over egg it. Actually, forget about that. I do think that Blood on the Clock Tower advances the genre in significant ways. It recognizes itself mechanically and culturally and improves upon a lot of tropes. But it is still a social deduction game. And that's fine, it's great even. I think a lot of people watching parts one and two will inevitably conclude that I just don't like this genre, which is so not true, I love it. I think it's whimsical, intoxicating, provoking and restorative to me. And also, I can see that some people who dislike social deduction games or got a bad vibe from them might might like Blood on the Clock Tower, and I'd like to help them figure out if this astronomical flight of fancy is worth the time, the shelf space, or even just one evening of their lives. Because frankly, I'm enamored. I'm about to be very excited, very effusive. But I don't want to be the person that just ropes you in by saying, hey, this is awesome, get in line, grab a robe, become a member. Because I think there's a responsibility to social deduction games that we as a community should start to recognize. And Blood on the Clock Tower is a small stepping stone towards that. Welcome to Raven's Bluff, a sleepy little village that's host to many different denizens like the librarian or the washerwoman or the great demon Vortox. And if you become the proud owner of BOTC, prepare to be neither of them, because you'll most likely be the storyteller, and you begin the game already dead, impaled on the eponymous clock tower. You're not actually dead, you're just the moderator, the person who knows all the rules and leads the proceedings. And more so than in Werewolf, you become pretty much a full-fledged game master, akin to the ones you get in role-playing games. That feels like a bum deal for the poor schmuck who shelled out a hundred bucks for a game. What's the point in owning a box if you can't even play it? Well, them's the breaks. With Blood on the Clock Tower, if you group gels with it, you'll likely get one or two people interested enough in maybe giving storytelling a go. There's nowhere near as much prep as actual game mastering, and some people just like being the host. And then of course, there's the box. And what a box it is. The size is what catches your attention first, but trust me, it's all utility and very little bombast. The cardboard is sturdier than some of the furniture in the Ikea range, and for good use too. You're meant to clip the two lids together to form a sort of open tome that during the game you'll carry around, doling out titillating bits of information or spelling doom to your players. When it's resting, it mounts on an included cardboard lectern. The game literally elevates the storyteller onto a pedestal. I think, again, it's just to make the proceeding smooth, although I suspect the allusions to a cult-like environment are not unintentional. The insides have a layer of felt glued on top, and that's appropriate because aside from catching dust and Jack Russell hairs if you happen to possess one, it'll also catch the entire framework of the game. Here you'll end up with a map of player roles. Since everyone is seated in a circle, you will also end up with a circle in your grimoire. And because the tokens are also lined with felt on their back, they will stay on until you no longer want them to. And due to the seeming complexity of roles, something we'll touch on later, you also have a reference sheet of everything you need to perform every night phase. And that's all very impressive, well thought out, and conducive to facilitating a smooth, immersive experience. But that's not what makes it a great experience. That lies solely in the purview of the rule books. Oh no. Oh no, there's five rule books and they're not small. Yeah, what can I say? This game needs them. But before you bolt through the curtain, let me tell you that if you were playing a game with an official Pandemonium Institute's demo, they would not teach you any rules at all. They would just drop you into a game with a handy reference sheet and let the wind guide you like a baby bird falling down from their nest. The actual rules take up just a few pages in one of the five. The rest 
is filled with necessary information for the storyteller for the one person who needs to bother. Again, we'll touch on why later, but that should give you all the clues you need to figure out if you want to buy Blood on the Clock Tower. But if you're not going to buy it, should you play it? Or should you convince one of your friends to buy it? Well, if you're open to the idea of social deduction games, yes, it's the best one by like a country mile. But what if you're not sure? Well, let me pull the curtains back for you. Not these curtains, there's just a wall behind them. I meant more like the metaphorical gameplay curtains. Pay no attention to the curtains. Anyway, we're off to see the demon, the wonderful demon of Oz. At the start of the game, everyone but the storyteller will sit in a circle, then they'll secretly get handed a role that only they will know, belonging either to the goodies or the baddies. Then the game will proceed in cycles of night and day, where during the day the players get to talk to each other and through a vote they can decide to eliminate someone, and then at night all their abilities trigger and also the demon gets to just have fun by murdering whoever they want. So far, so werewolf, but there's one important difference hiding under the fur. First of all, werewolf is notoriously lampooned for the player elimination problem. If, I'm sorry, when someone gets killed, and it's very likely to happen at the very beginning of the game, that player's game is over. Sure, their team could still win, but will they feel invested if their contribution was next to zilch. Let's see how the ultimate werewolf rulebook suggests we handle that. I'm sure there's some golden advice in here. Aha, when a player gets eliminated, they should just sit in silence and observe the game in its entirety, lest they break immersion for others or give away important information. Okay. Meanwhile, killing a player is integral to blood on the clock tower, although the word Killing here means something entirely different. If your player gets killed, you still get to play. It's just that your ability ceases to function and you still even get to vote, albeit you only get to vote one more time for the entire rest of the game. Imagine your ghost shambling back into the world of the living to deliver one final important piece of information, one final say. Do not microwave pizza pockets. Heat them up in the oven. So then killing becomes an active element of character design. Let's say you get the washerwoman role at the start of the game. That means that on the very first night, the storyteller will wake you up, point to two other players in the game and show you another townsfolk role. One of those players is that townsfolk. As a side note, the storyteller gets to choose all of the variables here, like who the other player is, or what role the washing woman gets to see. And that's fun in a mastermind kind of way because you can engineer situations like the other player being the demon, for example. But it's also a great tool to tilt the balance of the game into a more even state. So now you know that Herbert or Mr. Snuggles is the slayer, meaning Herbert could be the slayer or could be absolutely anyone else. Or Mr. Snuggles could be the Slayer. Or absolutely anyone else. But your role does nothing else. You've learned something at the start of the game and have no more ways of utilizing your special ability. In fact, it is the Slayer's role that is important because once per game, they can name a player and if that player is the demon, they die and you win. That's a powerful tool because it lets you eliminate a suspect, either from a pool of potential suspects or from the game. So maybe instead of sharing the information that you know with everyone, you do things like formulate strategies out loud, lead the proceedings, act like you're the mutts nuts, say things like, I don't wanna say what my role is, but it's important. Draw the demon's attention out, get them to eliminate you, all the meanwhile keeping Mr. Snuggle safe. It's okay, buddy, I'll always protect you. That all might sound like convoluted mind games for very experienced players, 
But actually, that's very typical gameplay for your very first Blood on the Clock Tower experience. And that's all thanks to scripts. There are three scripts in the core box. Trouble Brewing, Sects and Violets, and Bad Moon Rising. That's a catchy name, someone should write a song with that title. There's also a script tool available online with more scripts as printouts or even the ability to make your own. Scripts are a collection of all the possible roles that could come out in a game. So whilst the box features myriads of potential goodies or baddies you could be, each given game, depending on the chosen script, there's only about 20 something possibilities. This allows the game to be big with more roles than a bakery, but never overwhelming, especially because each player is handed their own personal reference sheet with all of the possible roles in the script and what they do. This not only helps me track information like that Mr. Snuggles is the Slayer or that Herbert could be the spy, but it also lets me cook up strategies. For example, let's say I've been handed the role of Monk. Each night I get to pick a player and if the demon chooses them as their victim at night, they don't die. I really would not rather be picked off by the demon, so instead of saying something like, hello everyone, I'm the monk, don't kill me, I instead scan the sheet for potential roles and then I spot the saint. If the saint is killed off via a vote of elimination, then the townsfolk lose, meaning it's a role the demon doesn't really want to touch, in case the townsfolk are stupid to try and do that anyway. So I pretend to be the saint. There's no way that's gonna go wrong, right? This makes each script its own little metagame, and since the official free scripts come with printed sheets for every player involved, those possibilities aren't just clear, whether you're new or seasoned, but also lets everyone dig into the deduction aspect. You spend a lot less of blood on the clock tower going, well, I think you're lying because my gut tells me so and my gut is never wrong, whilst munching on a free bean burrito and a lot more time detecting information, corroborating roles, connecting the dots, which might make it seem like the game leans heavily into favoring the good players. But, well, let me tell you, all about that over a lovely cup of tea. Yes, tea, come, please, drink, drink, mmm, yes, that's the spirit. Oops, I poisoned the camera person, which means I now control the narrative. Speaking of which, let's talk about minions and outsiders. Outsiders are good players, however, their roles are actively harmful towards the good team. This might sound counterintuitive, but it's just a way of balancing the game and making it feel more dynamic. I've already described the saint before, but there are other roles, like the drunk. When you're handed the role of a drunk, you don't know that you're the drunk. You are instead shown an entirely different role, again, one that the storyteller will choose for you. And whenever you try and activate that role's ability or do something with it, the storyteller feeds you gibberish without you even knowing. Then there's minions, evil players. They are not the demon, but they're working for Team Demon. A bit like being a tech bro. You might get roles like the spy who gets to look inside the grimoire at the start of the game, knowing everything about everyone. And then you get to do it again every night, it's brilliant. Or you might be the poisoner. Each night you'll choose another player and make them temporarily drunk for just one night, causing all kinds of confusion. So this game of heavy deduction is then counterbalanced with misinformation, perfectly emulating the current political climate of everywhere. Add to that the fact that at the start of the game, the demon will learn free roles they know are not in the game, enabling them to pretend that they're one of those roles, and you have yourself a buffet of alternative truths. They come on little cocktail sticks. I can't speak much for Bad Moon Rising or Sects and Violets, the more advanced scripts, as frankly, I've barely dipped my toes into them. 
but Trouble Brewing, I've played it and been the storyteller for more times than I can count. I've played it at conventions, I've played it with friends, i played it in the locker room of a Scottish ice ring, and I'm not joking. If you think that doesn't sound a very good environment or very thematic, let me tell you, it smelled of demons. I played it online, and every time it's been an absolute hit, and if that script was the entire game, I still think it would be worth the price of admission. As the game draws to a close, if you're the townsfolk, you whittle down to two possibilities, one a truth and one a lie. And that's pretty much any social deduction game. But I hope I highlighted how the process of getting there differs. Whereas if you're team evil, well, you still lie and misdirect your friends but you're doing it with gamified tools of misinformation rather than dipping into antisocial behavior like bullying or shouting. These tactics stand on much shakier ground. The rules for BOTC have many vagaries, many possible interpretations, hence five booklets. Not only do you get a comprehensive guide on how to tackle this beast, but each role is detailed with nuances, strategies, and niche situations. If I was feeling poetic, and I guess I am, I'd compare hosting to playing guitar. It doesn't take a lot of effort to make noise, but master it in a single stroke creates music. As the storyteller, ultimately you're the one who makes the calls, but there's so much elaboration that 90-90-99% of the time you'll feel like you're not just pulling a rule out of a hat. Those rule books are here to guide you. Crucially, Blood on the Clock Tower recognizes that a good game master isn't someone who knows the rules. It's someone who enjoys watching their friends have a really good time and knowing that they created that, and maintaining a positive environment from something that literally stems from a psychology experiment is fraught with more pitfalls than pitfall. Comparatively, here's the booklet for Ultimate Werewolf. It would be unfair to say that it thrusts you into the role of Game Master without any preparation, but any advice it has is sparse and frequently not very useful. Not to mention this section on social disclaimers where it just tells you that Ultimate Werewolf is great in virtually any environment and for any person, and when it comes to psychological dynamics, it literally throws the what happens in Ultimate Werewolf stays in Ultimate Werewolf line at you, which, you know, what? Let me now read you a passage from Blood on the Clock Tower's rulebook. Dealing with negative behavior is something you may have to do sooner or later. As is the case with all social gatherings, sometimes a player will speak in a disrespectful tone to another player. Blood on the Clock Tower is a social game, which means social tools are useful in playing it. There are good, fun ones like charm or humor, but one or two players may get a little caught up in the excitement and revert to some of the more negative social tools, such as shouting, bullying, or emotional blackmail. Any player behavior that is unpleasant or otherwise destructive to the good vibe of the game should be nipped in the bud. This type of behavior is not acceptable as other players may feel uncomfortable at best or argumentative and victimized at worst. Every player deserves to be in an environment where they feel accepted, respected, and be able to make their own decisions. Frankly, that's not just more awareness than other social deduction games, it's more awareness than most board games. But I am not surprised or impressed because it feels par for the course. Which leads us into Travelers and the Fabled, special roles for special circumstances. Travelers are powerful roles that can be given to players who need to arrive late or want to leave early. They've got a lot of impact, but they don't have to stay for the entire thing. And secretly, that's a great role to give to someone who's not sure whether this experience is for them at all. Want to drop out? Go ahead, you won't ruin the game for anyone else, but you'll still get to do things. And the fabled are roles for storytellers, although they're not roles per se, and more adjustments to the game. In particular, I like to highlight the revolutionary role, which lets you pair up two people at the start of the game, they will belong to the same faction, 
and know each other's roles. This is great if you have a pair of players who just hate lying to each other or don't want to do that, they will be in a little bubble of truth. This is also great if you have players with extra needs. For example, if you have a deaf player, you can pair them up with the person that can sign to them and they'll know that whatever they're being signed is reliable information. So often, kickstarted games end up being big boxes of content, actively harming themselves with their size, whereas Blood on the Clock Tower uses its components as a compromise. They need to be this big box and these slick sheets and these felt tokens, not because of volume, but because that's what it takes to be the game that's accommodating to the widest array of players possible. It's just more convenient and more clear and more gamey than any iteration of Werewolf or Mafia before it. Does that make Blood on the Clock Tower a safer game? Less of a psychological experiment? Who can say, really? It's new ground, so at best we can guesstimate, and I'm not academically equipped to do that. I know games, not brains. It certainly offers the tools to create safer, more welcoming spaces that are not prone to bullying, but what we have here is a product made by a company. And now that it's arriving on people's doorsteps, the onus is on Pandemonium Institute to curate their community. And that does include things like taking the space in their rulebook to explain the potential dangers or creating accommodating roles, but also curating their online communities and carefully choosing who promotes their product. I can't think of a word that's more marketing speak than visionary, but at the same time, I can't think of another adjective that succinctly describes what Blood on the Clock Tower is. There's been some hubbub around it in terms of Kickstarter fulfillment because it definitely took its time to get to players' hands. But what I have here in front of me can only be described as uncompromised. The creators of this game knew exactly what they wanted it to be, exactly how it should treat its players and they went ahead and made that, no matter how much time or effort it cost. So when I say visionary, I don't mean that it's good, although I certainly think it's very good. I mean that it achieves itself. And to make matters more complicated and obtuse, I don't think I can even put my finger down on what exactly Blood on the Clock Tower is, because it's just so big in its idea. It is absolutely more than Werewolf, but it is also just Werewolf. And it is undoubtedly more socially conscious, but it's still a social deduction game. And it comes with the social group dynamic perils of social deduction games. And if you hate those, you might actually like this one, but also you might just hate it. I call it Quantum Werewolf, as in you need to observe it to land on its properties, but Quantum Werewolf already exists, so let me instead end on another paradox. It is a total must-buy, but also, you'll be fine if you never hear about this game again. Side effects may include lying, lost friendships, bullying, verbal abuse, a general change of personality, insomnia, and psychological trauma. I really hope you found this video enjoyable and useful. This is the most ambitious video our little channel has ever created, with months of research, conducting interviews, and some of the work beginning even before the pandemic. If you want to support our work, the majority of our income comes from viewers such as yourselves who back us on Patreon. If you do decide to join our Patreon, you'll get access to the full interview with Alan Girding. I think it's really good and well worth the admission cost alone. I'd like to thank Angelus for introducing me to Blood on the Clock Tower, Quinton Smith for lending me the prototype all these years ago, Margaret Robertson and William Herkowitz for writing articles on Mafia, and Andrew Plotkin and Alan Girding for being such gracious and forthcoming interviewees. Their ideas helped me shape this video. Alan Girding co-runs the tabletop game publishing company Tuesday Night Games, who, amongst other titles, publish Two Rooms and a Boom, another example of a social deduction game that reduces the space for bullying. Andrew Plotkin is a famed interactive fiction designer. You can find his works on zarfhome.com. After interviewing Andrew, I tried his game Hadean Lands and thought it was pretty great. You should check it out. There's some extra bonus videos we release there from time to time, and also you'll get access to our Discord server, which is a kind place on the internet.
Thank you.